speaker is uh, Nishant Batra, Chief Strategy and Technology Officer. Um, without further delay, I'm going to just hand over to Nishant and, 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 and let's go from here. All right. Thank you. Can you hear me OK? Yes. And I'm under the assumption that uh, you guys will control the slides. Is that a correct assumption to her? Yes. OK, very good. So uh, thanks for having me. It's uh, interesting. I was listening into the to the debate that uh, Brian and Manisha were having. So very interesting, very, very enlightening. Uh, I hope the rest of the session has been going well. I'll take a few minutes to talk us through a few slides. Uh, the intent here would be to talk about data as um, Manisha very well concluded in our last speech. And we'll also be talking about uh, a little bit around artificial intelligence, which works around structured data. So uh, let's see. Uh, I, I, without getting into all the details of this slide, right? I mean, we have seen several waves or eras, right? I mean, we see uh, the first uh, era about browsers, and then we went to search where Google starts to come in in a big way. Then we get into content sharing, video, etc. Today, as we think about the world, and, and if you look at the bottom curve, uh, the data just keeps going up and up and up. Uh, so we're we're sitting in a, in an era where there is immense amount of sharing, uh, immense amount of personalization, commerce, uh, especially driven as subsequent to the pandemic, has really gone through the to the roof. If you look at any industry that was previously digitized under the, uh, you know, uh, before the pandemic, just look at the return on equity on those companies. Digital has really taken off in a very, very big way uh, post pandemic for whether it's financial services, commerce, retail, et cetera, et cetera. And now we're, we're, we're at the cusp of what we believe at Nokia and Bell Labs is uh, we're at the cusp of the first networked intelligence and automation era. And when I say cusp is because we already see this, we see intelligence, we see intelligence in the networks, we intelligence in the cloud, we intelligence at say at the edge of the network. But when we say in a true market uptake formation, we expect that to really come, the hockey stick comes in effect now. Uh, this will of course be driven by a substantial amount of consumer, but also substantial amount of enterprise getting connected on the traditional terrestrial 3GPP networks complemented by some others. And then this hockey curve, in our humble opinion, will further steepen, and that's on the back of 5G advanced. This is what we're talking about for some of our standards driven folks, uh, release 18 and onwards. It gets a real shot in the arm, uh, with the feature set, with the capability to really push industrial automation and enterprise connectivity to the next level. And that's when the data really takes off. So next, Ashish. Um, here, essentially, we talk about, and I, I have talked about this previously in many other forums as well, that we see that data-driven networks today are very much in the in the phase of system performance, right? We're really looking for that cost per bit. Used to be cost per Erlang. Now we're really looking for that cost per bit. Uh, we're looking for how do we optimize uh, parameters like uh, air, light, power, tower in terrestrial wireless networks. Those are the four big ones. We try to maximize for optical connectivity. We look for spectral optimization. We look for tower. Uh, uh, optimization and power optimization. That's what the first phase of system performance is really about. We're now thinking about and entering here in the industry a wave of software agility and the inflection point is really ICT and OT coming together. The world of ICT and operational transformation really coming together uh, in the 5G area, era. And here it's not about just making sure that you get the most out of the spectrum that you have or the tower assets that you have or, 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 or such. It's about really finding the use case differentiation for the enterprise CIO uh, who's not looking for connectivity as the solution, who's looking for a solution based on connectivity. And that's where the data really takes off as well. And very soon thereafter, we do expect that the wave will transform itself to a network as a service 
wherein you're offering the network in a very frictionless mechanism to enterprises, whether it be enterprises which are, oh Lord, which are enterprises which are connected uh, uh, for sensing, for IoT, or for connectivity for other application use, such as cloud and network mashups. So we see that the industry over the coming years will evolve in these three waves. If you click next, Ashish. And I've talked about here the first wave, really maximizing your TCO, uh, physical resource utilization. If you click one more, because I want to exemplify that now. And here's an example now. Uh, the example really pertains to uh, how do we maximize uh, the impact of AI from a TCO perspective? What you see is, is a traditional cell tower. You see a bunch of antennas. You see some uh, radios. Uh, there, are, there are basically multiband antennas on their radios, uh, and there's a microwave link on the other side. That's what this is about. This is a traditional cell tower, right? And today, this is the largest single asset outside of spectrum on operators books. And it depreciates and uh, it has a lifespan. The problem is a lot of the operators don't know what the value of that true asset out there is. So how do they get that asset inventory? They either climb the towers and, and get their inventory, which is prohibitively expensive. So what we did with AI, a very simple example, uh, instead of finding riggers and climbers, uh, we, we just looked at uh, uh, 80, 90 images from a bunch of towers, and then we had uh, a deep neural network uh, for object detection and classification. Uh, pretty standard approach, but then we took neighboring images and matched them by sequential drone images and then transformed using some computational geometry. And essentially, by then a majority vote mechanism, we decided what the inventory on the tower is, and then we replicated this across the asset base. And without spending millions, hundreds of millions, we were able to get an up to 85% accuracy of an inventory of an operator to really get the TCO right. One example, if you click one more, because this is more on the passive side, here's one that is on the active side. Massive MIMO, this, this, this audience is very well aware of what this is. So the, if you look at a, a, at a massive MIMO system, it has about 32 beams at its disposal. And this is done with a, with a TTI, right? One millisecond TTI. And to optimize the resources, the scheduler has to make in a single TTI a decision so that it's, it's offering the most optimal beams, basically layers per user, right? And instead of just the uh, scheduler being, you know, a simple scheduler, which is naive and greedy just to provide beams where it could, you could optimize this using some artificial intelligence. And what we do, again, this is reinforcement learning, deep neural network. We look at the problem and without getting into a lot of details, we look at the feedback from the from the device and we look at in, a, in the, that instant, which four beams will optimize the resource in the maximum possible way. And the neural network allows us to do that. So out of a choice of 30,000 beams, we pick four, those four layers will offer the best throughput. And this is an, again, a very good example in the first wave of system performance of using artificial intelligence. Here, the data is quite structured because we're getting user data. It's, it's a closed loop system and we get the output as a consequence. If you click one more, Ashish. Second wave, I've talked about that, software agility. How fast can you build use cases? How fast can you offer software on top of those systems? This is simply built on the construct of openness, cloud native, essential. You, you're not talking here about embedded system. This is cloud native, open, and highly automated systems. If you click one more, 
Here's another example that I'd like to offer to you. Here's now artificial intelligence helping telecom operators through self-organizing networks. As some of us are painfully aware, to optimize a network, you have thousands of parameters and the RF conditions change rapidly. So how do you get there? And there, there are serious trade-offs, right? You change one parameter and you're trying to do power control and then suddenly uh, you have limited the coverage, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you want to then do this in a way that the overall network is optimized. So what the teams at Nokia have done, they have used artificial intelligence to really learn as to how the parameters impact the network from a coverage and capacity perspective. And then we use some complex mathematical models. Basically, we're looking at Bayesian probabilities and Markov decision processes. And then we optimize the network as we learn over, over time. And it has been quite clear to us when we look at the KPIs that a self-organizing network built on a deep neural network has far better KPIs than if we were to just drive and optimize in a very traditional way. Pre-dive, post-drive versus just running a SON algorithm run. Huge difference. Uh, if you click one more, Ashish. And then the final wave, network as a service. Uh, I've talked about that, so if you click one more. Just one example here as well. Uh, and the example here is AI as a service, right? So we've launched a, a service called AVA. It's on, uh, it's on public cloud and it uh, combines telco grade security and web scale architecture instantly. And basically the use cases that we're looking at, we're looking at RF coverage optimization, we're looking at KPI degradation detection. In some cases, alarm clearance. If you've ever been part of an operations, uh, you basically get 20,000 alarms an hour. And how do you do fault management and resolve those? It, at several such cases, right? You're looking at ticket triaging, et cetera, et cetera. And this is only one such field where AVA helps you out. And you are then basically converting that network into a service. And uh, you could do this uh, from, a, from an energy efficiency perspective or analytics perspective. The AVA is a full suite offering those use cases for network optimization, cost optimization, power optimization, et cetera. So again, an example of how AI starts to play a very relevant role in that way for network is now being offered as a service in a frictionless way. If you click one more, and now I, I want to just conclude because I know I have 15 minutes, Ashish, so I will stick to those. Uh, uh, you know, this term of AI, uh, it's, it, it's, it's, it's very synonymous to, to what electricity was, right? And we've been thinking about that in Nokia and research and design in our digital organization. Here's a very good example. In 1881 is when Edison built the electric uh the first electricity generation station in manhattan and then it took nearly 50 years because manufacturing really finally figured out how to use that term and that the technology called electricity and there were several steps right 20 years after it was invented only less than five percent of mechanical drive power was coming from electric motors. So even though the invention had happened, took 20 years to get, you know, 1 20th of the power coming from a city, it took nearly 50 years. And then we got the gains in productivity. If you click one last time, Ashish, we see artificial intelligence similarly. Of course, when there is a uh, disruptive technologies, you usually overestimate the effects in the short term and underestimate in the long term, as several of you may have heard. AI really became very relevant when Bell Labs uh, started to experiment with it. Uh, we basically, uh, we applied a convolutional neural network architecture and solved the real world problem of recognizing handwritten digits, pretty simple. Nowadays, it's one of the most simple examples, but back then it was revolutionary. And then several steps later, in 2020, you see that Guardian publishes an article which is actually not written by a human, but is completely AI authored. And 
until we knew we didn't know. And when we knew we found out, OK, was that AI? And it has taken a while. And the brilliance of this technology is that we're only in step one of step 10. My last message before we go into Q&A, when we look at data, it has to get structured, clean, available, single source, and then you look at AI as the engine to unleash that data, but it has to be done in a responsible, in a transparent and ethical way. This technology has many prongs. We have to use it responsibly. I stop here, Ashish.